So yeah, but after decoding, uh, what you're going to get is not a uh, not a uh, the maximally mixed state, but it's going to give just a pure pure state density matrix about cat state. So in some sense, by combining this like some entangling measurement and decoding, I effectively realize this casting projection operator, which is infinite time imaginary time evolution. So we can add, so the thing is the, but the original question was whether this protocol is a stable against some perturbations. And uh, it, there are kind of three layers of question uh, to attack this problem under this perturbation. The first one is whether each of the trajectory has some non-trivial entanglement structure. And the second question is whether we can decode all different trajectory into a kind of single consistent one so that from the observable side, we can get uh, some interesting measurement outcomes, uh, some interesting kind of correlation uh, without doing any post-selection. And finally, uh, one can ask whether we can generalize this to a broader class of quantum orders. So, uh, to uh, answer this question, I, I'd like to kind of mention that the state we got to, to measure this ZZ operator uh, by, uh, by introducing Ancilla, they form a, something called a cluster state with pretty interesting kind of correlation structure that ZXZ is one, as I mentioned, so that when you measure X, you're immediately specifying what ZZ is. And uh, this kind of like, this is basically a symmetry protected topological order, and it is characterized by non-local order parameter given by the string of operators, like a 2z at each end, and product of x on the even side in the middle. So because this is one, as soon as you're kind of, and this is true for any kind of string, so as soon as you're measuring, specifying all the x, you're kind of specifying uh, kind of uh, the long range zz correlation between the remaining sites. And, but because you didn't do this without like, without kind of perturbing anything about the original kind of red qubit, you're going to get a, a superpositions of two opposite kind of magnetization. So uh, in order to understand the effects of kind of corrupted measurement, uh, there are multiple different ways. You can think about directly applying quantum channel uh, uh, flipping the measurement outcome kind of stochastically, but one kind of interesting direction is you can is like imagining you're applying some rotation with angle theta before measurement. So this rotation will effectively kind of uh, hide your uh, corrupt your measurement outcome because like originally it was aligned on x axis, but if it's slightly rotated, even if it's like x equals one, there's some chance that you're going to measure x equals minus one, right? And what I can show is that this procedure, rotating by theta and measuring all the outcomes with uh, all, all the like ancilla qubits with outcome S2, S4, S6, is actually given by imaginary time evolution by like this Ising Hamiltonian with some now finite time. So this is actually interesting, right? Because when we have everything perfect, it was realizing infinite time kind of evolution, but now with some imperfect kind of measurement, imperfect procedure, it's realizing this uh, finite time evolution. And what's happening is that your wave function, originally consisting of superpositions of all possible configuration in Z basis, is each of the component is going to be weighted by this Boltzmann factor. And the correlation structure of this wave function basically resembles one-dimensional Ising model. And we all know that one-dimensional Ising model has no long range order at any finite temperature meaning that there's no long range order at any finite angle. But we know that in one higher dimension, there is a long range correlation for Ising order. So indeed, I goes to a higher dimension, arrange qubits in the vertices of the square lattice, assign qubits on the edges, and entangle them. OK, again, I cannot see it well, but I'm entangling them in such a way that you develop kind of zx equals 1 correlation. And you measure all the. Uh, uh, x qubits, uh, uh, all the uh, y qubits in x basis, and then, uh, and then you you're going to be able to get the cat state. But now you can imagine like this measurement outcome to be corrupted, and it can be mapped into kind of imaginary time evolution by kind of two dimensionalizing model Hamiltonian, 
And we know that there's a kind of finite temperature transition behavior. So I can say that, I can show that there's a kind of finite rotation angle where uh, uh, you can still get some test state out of it. Uh, Steve? Assuming the error the I'm doing that, but actually it doesn't have to be. I can imagine the theta is just like a random variable uh, with some finite range, finite variance, and everything just goes through in the same way. This is random bond diving model, actually. Right. As you can see, these are on the bonds, right? Yeah. 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 And or, uh, I, So decoding can be done in a similar fashion. Let me just skip that. But the problem here is that there is some frustration. So you have to do some kind of Bayesian inference, solve some Bayesian inference problem to figure out uh, the what red qubits are. And experimentally, you can do something to really get the cast state uh, entanglement out of this, say, when there's a decoherence. But for the sake of time, let me skip this quickly. But one interesting part is that uh, it the physics of this Okay. Oh, this is like 2D classicalizing model. Yeah, yeah, try, try. yeah. Mm -hmm. no, maybe maybe we can talk after. <laughs> Yeah, this is again a special fine tune point and yeah. Yeah, go to the extreme limit window, but this year, like all the coupling constants are either plus one or minus one in some sense. No, it's one or zero in infinity. <laughs> so it goes one limit or the other. Mm. So the problem this was a confusing thing. So suppose I don't know the fine tune state. What uh, so all you care is whether the final kind of mixed state has this a long range entanglement. So all I'm caring is not like exact wave function structure, wave function, but actually here I'm interested in kind of the kind of long range correlation in a way that uh, has a kind of local kind of expectation value is zero. Sure. So anyway, I, what I want to say is that like. Uh, as a function of error rate or as a function of theta, uh, like I can think about a decoding protocol. When you're decoding, you should kind of assume what your underlying error rate is. And if you if you use the perfect decoder that basically assuming the error rate as exactly as your kind of true error rate, then you're on this red line and the transition point is captured by, uh, a, a transition happens when error rate is about 11%. This is called the Nishimori line. But even when your decoder is kind of stupid, it just assumes that like there is basically no errors almost. Uh, you're along this like a uh, uh, horizontal axis, but you can see that like the performance difference is only minor. Like even when your decoder is not optimal decoder, it can actually do pretty well. And the uh, actually Nishimori initially conjectured that this line would be of the random. It's actually a phase diagram of the random randomizing model. He conjectured that this should be a straight line. But actually, this is slightly bent toward the inward. I mean, there's some kind of order by disorder behavior. Anyway, so what I really did is that I established a stability under kind of various ingredients. I established that even if your entanglement is faulty or measurement or decoding is faulty, you can still get some robust kind of long range entanglement. So you can maybe think that this is some new phase of matter in some sense. And what I'm really saying is that when things are income imperfect, it's this protocol is really realizing some kind of imaginary time evolution with kind of finite time, not infinite time anymore. 
So I was asking myself, why is there a sharp error threshold? Like our fundamental kind of capability of transforming this a short range entangled state into a long range entangled state. Why is there kind of sharp threshold for the error rate? Uh, in some sense, uh, like this a short range entangled state is like kind of a resource. And by doing a measurement and decoding operation, you're kind of rearranging its entanglement through some kind of teleportation in such a way that you get kind of long range entanglement. And it's gone beyond some error threshold. So I was trying to uh, explore the fundamental reason behind of this sharp transition. And, and one of the like, uh, one different motivation is that if you think about kind of string order, uh, string order parameter, which is a z x x x is z. Uh, I mentioned that like the presence of this order prime is the reason why we, we get a like, cat state when there's no decoherence. But as soon as there's a decoherence, this kind of string operator all decays exponentially with the size. So it's kind of unclear whether we can actually get kind of a uh, long range correlation when there's a decoherence. But what I found is that the string order parameter is actually another fundamental quantity characterizing this uh, short range entangled SPT state. What's fundamental is that it is some, well, there's a more complicated information theoretical metrics, but uh, here more better kind of, for better physical intuitions, I'm talking about conditional correlation functions. So when you measure all the even sites, you get some correlation function for the remaining red qubits. And uh, the thing is that like, when you measure all the remaining qubits, this uh, red size is kind of a non-trivial kind of correlation, kind of sign structure. Although it's kind of kind of like a ferromagnetic, their sign structure doesn't have to be all like plus one. It can be plus minus, plus minus, right? And what I can show is that our string order parameter is like a sign sum of this conditional correlation. So what really determines our capacity to convert this short range entangled state into a long range entangled state is this upper bound, kind of the, the norm of this uh, conditional correlation function averaged over kinda, all possible measurement outcomes. So, so how can you capture this? Uh, well, I went by a slogan that the density matrix knows the answer. So like the procedure I talked about, entanglement measurement decoding can be just written this way. You apply some noise, you perform some measurement, perform some unitary condition on your measurement outcome, and you sum over all like measurement outcomes, and what I basically showed is that this thing, complicated object, turns into a, the pure state density matrix for cat state when there's no decoherence. And even when there's a decoherence, this can still have properties of cat state. So, uh, so like I wanted to look at density matrix directly. How I should do it? Well, simply density matrix is a two to the n by two to the n matrix, but I vectorize that into four to the n by one vector like a pure state living in the double Herbert space. And now in this language, the coherence acts like some kind of coupling between these two copies of state in the double Herbert space. So now problem reduces into the study of pure state, which we are all familiar of. And uh, what I can now do is imagine there's a two SPT orders and there's some kind of coupling between two layers. And I can inspect what the kind of order parameters are what kind of phase we get in this kind of like coupled Hamiltonian defined in the double Herbert space. And basically uh, I can define different types of kind of correlation function. I can show that there's a some type that measures kind of decoupleness of these two layers and that undergoes a phase transition. I can measure some quantity that captures a uh, non-trivialness of this entire wave function in the double Herbert space that undergoes another phase transition. So there's a hierarchy of phase transition. And what's really interesting is that this first phase corresponds to whether we can extract any non-trivial information about this kind of topological wave function in an efficient manner. And the second regime that tells you whether we can just extract anything at all. It can be potentially very inefficient. Like you can imagine a case where a dictionary falls into a black hole, black hole evaporates into Hawking radiations, and your goal is reconstructing dictionary out of all this Hawking radiation. We know that this is in principle possible, but this is exponentially difficult, meaning that practically it's almost impossible. And the second regime is kind of like that. And when the coherence is too strong, you're left with nothing. 
So uh, this first phase transition kind of really gives the upper bound for whether we can decode any interesting information at all. And this exactly aligns with uh, the threshold I got with in the work with Matthew for the, the previous protocol. And uh, there is also more interesting information theoretic uh, understanding of this. So you can imagine a bit string in, and you can try to array, uh, arrange them in a square array, like 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And you can assign the bond uh, plus minus sign uh, given by, uh, determined by these vertices. When they're different, this is minus one. When they're same, it's a one. And the receiver side, you receive only the bond information. And the receiver's goal is trying to figure out what the vertex versus bit string is. And if receiver side just runs a Monte Carlo simulation of Ising model using bond variable, as if there's an interaction, they can recover bit string up to overall spin flip. And that's a classical version, which appeared almost like 50 years ago. And now there's a now quantum version. Uh, instead of like doing this, you can assign kind of plus qubits and apply some unitary gates and do some decoding. And you can basically show that uh, when there is some kind of noise coming into these edge qubits, our capacity to decode the original information in the vertex qubits uh, undergoes some sharp phase transition. There is a phase transition of this a classical channel capacity. And same thing can be discussed for also topological orders. Like uh, if you do basically the same thing for what I did uh, in the double Hubbard space, you get two copies of Tor code and the coherence acts like a tunneling of anions. And when, what we know is that when anion tunneling is very strong, this uh, anion get the anion pairs get condensed and we get a single toric code. And this transition also captures when we can decode logical qubits encoded in the, like uh, say toric code or generate uh, topological orders. And, uh, but, but for this transition, I'm only assuming that uh, your toric code state is getting decohered, but your measurement is perfect. Uh, so this paper is gonna capture such a situation, but it's possible that measurement becomes imperfect. In such a case, what I can do is thinking about multiple copies of this system and embed them into one higher dimensional SPT state and study the information theory property of this SPT state under decoherence. So there are lots of interesting future directions. Uh, so through this kind of program, research program, what I figured out was there's a kind of fundamental bound on our capability to extract information uh, when our wave function is under decoherence. It can be whether we can verify that what we have is SPQ or not. It can be uh, whether we can decode some classical information or quantum information from the wave function or something more. Uh, yeah, thank you. More important, most important thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I got to develop all these ideas when I talked with Matthew Fisher at KITP. Like he kept asking me kind of critical questions because I was think I was kind of happy with like some partial results. And Matthew was like, keep asking me a question, is this real physics? Can you actually observe it? And that's when I uh, came up with this idea of decoding and what's really hidden in this like setup. So that's also how I got to reach this idea of, oh, there's what we are doing is not really a, maybe more beyond like conventional many body physics, like many body physics of information. So yeah, information is a real thing you can measure and extract. Permutation. Right. Uh, so actually, uh, I'm kind of writing up the no go for kind of possible structure in this double Herbert space. The thing is that not anything is possible in this double Herbert space because 
what you get is you're deforming density matrix into double Hilbert space. And there is like positivity, hermeticity, there are several constraints. And that's kind of constraining what possible physical double state wave function is. And I think genome is probably impossible. Impossible. Yeah, impossible. Uh, yeah, it's less interesting than what you think, but it's still interesting enough for me. <laughs> Oh, Stephen? Beautiful. I let the follower the hurt the clock in this, but I had a question about the back to disorder. So in disordered systems, sometimes what's important is rare events, even if you're weak disorder. But here you somehow got a bound on theta, all the thetas are small. Right. What happens if you have rare bridges in which theta is big? Uh so this kind of uh, order is defined in a kind of average sense. Right. You're kind of averaging over all possible measurement outcomes, all possible kind of error cases. So I think few rare events would not affect much. And if few rare events affect the entire physics, then that means that like information is not stored in a robust way anyway. So then things will be fragile. Things will just. I mean, there are like some of the edge states turn out to be. Uh... Uh, delicate to rare events. So, uh, in, in such a case, what's going to happen is as soon as you introduce the decoherence, such a feature will be gone. Yeah. So actually, the unfortunately preparation of, of the topological order, including non-nullity and topological order, uh, is very fragile. As soon as there's a measurement error, then uh, it's not going to topological order anymore. So one interesting scheme I'm developing is that if you attach kind of log L square volume to each of the qubit then you can kind of parametrically make the protocol robust. It's like when you have a 1D Eisen model, uh, it has no finite temperature robustness. But if you stack Eisen model, then the robot it gets kind of exponentially robust with the stacks, right? With the with the number of stacks. Yeah. So it's pretty there's a pretty interesting result. I think that the robot doesn't think that's possible. 